Hello everyone. In today's video we're going to have a look at mechanical point control and the volt in tube method using a switch and sometimes cranks to control points remotely. It's sometimes in more advanced setups where one switch can control multiple points but generally a less common but often cost effective and low noise solution to remote point control. In terms of materials needed for this project then the rodding used to control the points is piano wire 0.032 inches that's available from Squires. To keep the piano wire in uh, straight lengths and stop it from bending when under uh, pressure you need it to be in brass tube so that's the 1 16th of an inch brass tube. If you want to connect multiple lengths of this brass tube which comes in 12 inch sections you might want the 3 30 seconds of an inch brass tube which uh, allows you to telescope one inside the other kind of thing. In order to actually actuate the movement of the rodding I've used a miniature sliding switch and the important thing with this is that the amount the switch moves needs to be about equivalent to the amount the tie bar moves on the points. So to measure that I took a piece of the piano wire, place the point on a bit of cardboard and in both positions poked the piano wire through the tie bar to make a little hole in the cardboard then measured it using a ruler and for this Hornby standard point that came out at about three and a half millimeters as you can see which is pretty close to the 3.2 millimeter travel of this miniature toggle switch so that's pretty perfect and then the final thing you might need if you need to take the rodding through any kind of angles is some miniature angle cranks. These are the ones I use the GEM angle cranks and bases. I don't think they're actually available anymore. I can't find them anywhere anyway. And as you can see, they're quite expensive on this website that does list them as out of stock. So if you do want to use cranks, I'll do a separate video on how to do some DIY ones of those. I'll link that on screen now and at the end of the video as well. So the simplest implementation of this really is the direct drive method where the piano wire goes through a little hole drilled in the side of the sliding switch and then through some brass tube until it gets to the tie bar for the point. Now I've done this on a non-scenic section of my baseboards and kind of fill yard area but if you wanted to do it in a scenic section you could just embed the tube into the baseboard or track bed material such as a cork. So first of course you just need to poke the piano wire through the brass tube cut to the appropriate length and then just using pliers grab the end of the piano wire slide up the brass tube to where you want the bend to be to help it form a nice sharp bend and then just bend it through 90 degrees and then you can plant the tube into the notch in the track bed material and try and angle the piano wire to poke upwards and place that through the hole in the tie bar. That's all you really need to do for the uh, most simple application. So then if I demonstrate this by just pulling and pushing on the end of the wire and it controls directly the points with minimal noise and in a low cost solution. In terms of the uh, termination of the piano wire then at the end where you're going to control it from, some people just uh, fold it into a bit of a loop to pull and push. I prefer to do this which uses a electrical sliding switch. You don't have to use the electrical side for anything Although whether you could do that for switching frogs on points, I don't know, because I'm not into that kind of stuff. But I just find these kind of switches are pretty perfect for getting a nice reliable control method. So that most simple implementation works well if you've got a small shunting layout or something similar where you can just move along one side of the baseboard pulling all the uh, rods. But if you want a more complex system with uh, truly remote point control, maybe with a centralized control area, you might need to use cranks. And these allow you to move the direction of travel through 90 degrees or some sort of angle to allow you to change the direction to 
bend around corners and get to where you want the control from. It's basically the same idea, except you have the cranked. So if your switch is off to the left here, we can move that switch and then that makes the points move perpendicular to it. And it's worth mentioning, of course, that if you didn't want all this mechanical stuff on top of your baseboard, like I have here in my non scenic section, you could just drill holes through the baseboard and connect it all up on the other side. And what you can do with that as well is have the same switch run multiple points. So this crank has two holes on each arm. So you can see that the switch is off to the left. That's driving the crank, which is changing the point at the top of the screen. But it's also running through the crank onto the next point, which is further over to the right. And that is again used as a crank in this case, so that the one switch can operate a crossover. It's really quite handy. And because I've used an electrical switch, the sliding switch to control these things, I can even do a bit of a party trick. So if I dim the lights here and turn on these indicator lights, which show which track the train is on, as I slide the switch, the lights switch over to show which way the crossover points are selected. So I do just want to add a bit of a note here about uh, which hole you chose to use on each of the arms of uh, the crank if you choose to use cranks. Bear with me because it is a bit complicated going through this, but it's worth making sure you get it right, particularly in cases where you're using multiple cranks in succession to make sure that you get the correct distance of travel or throw at both or all the points being operated from one switch. So it's important that you consider the change or the effect it's going to have on the amount of movement you get by using the which hole on the input and which hole on the output. So if we imagine then that the input is coming to this hole and the output comes off this hole, then you'll see that the same distance is between this hole and the pivot as this hole and the pivot. So this gets a ratio of input and output of one to one. But you can imagine that, as I mentioned earlier, our switch has a distance of travel of 3.2 millimeters and our points actually want to move 3.5 millimeters. So how do we do that? Well, if we keep the input the same, but move the output from the inner hole to the outer hole, we get a mechanical advantage because this distance here is less than this distance here. So that gets an increased throw. And it's worth pointing out that this is relevant also if you're using more than one crank. So if you have an input coming in here and a continuation going off this one, this will get you an increased throw or an increased distance, movement distance on this continuation compared to the input due to the distance from the crank being greater. So then if we go up to the other crank at the top, you can imagine we've come from the continuation here. If we went out at the same hole as the output to the point, we'd get a one-to-one -one ratio here on this crank. But if we've got the correct throw and use the one-to-one -one ratio at the first crank, we want to have a reduction here because that's increased the throw to the continuation. So we'd have to use this as the output to get a reduction. So in summary, if you're using two cranks for this kind of crossover type arrangement like I've done, this will give you a one-to-one -one arrangement where a short movement here causes a big movement on the continuation because that's going to a larger hole, uh, one further away. And then that gets reduced down again at the other crank. And it's in the same distance hole here at the first crank, so that's a one-to-one -one there. So that's a good setup, and these two movements will be the same. If you use the wrong hole here or the wrong hole there, relative to the other one, you would actually get a um, di different amount of movement to each one and they might have a tendency to jam. So it is important to make sure you get that right. 
if you did want to increase the throw it would be simply a case of swapping to the opposing hole at each of those so there you would get a small movement here gets an increased movement here and here with a one-to-one -one ratio there but all again taking place on this crank I hope that makes a bit of sense I appreciate it's pretty complicated so if we look at how I've actually done that in practice then you start with a switch which is the 3.2 millimeter throw and then we come up to this crank so it goes into the inner one and out from the outer one of this to the point which is at the top of the screen there and then out on the continuation to the next crank from the bottom one which gives me the mechanical advantage or the gain of throw the increased throw to both the point and the continuation section and then when I get out to the second crank I'm doing the outer one as the input to that and the outer one also as the output to the point here so that's no change of throw there so I've got the same amount of th throw at both tie bars so I hope you found that another useful tip for DIY low-cost model railways if you're interested in giving this a go please do watch my other video on how to make some miniature angle cranks from scratch if you want more ideas like this feel free to subscribe and thanks for watching catch you next time